today. Um, pleased to have Dave Dave Lomay accepted to, to do this talk on cost performance. He gave a really interesting talk at the Damon workshop at, at Sigmod um, and was under a lot of time pressure there for obviously for a shorter presentation. So he'll have a little more time today to, to really spell out the details. So, Dave. Yeah, th thanks, Phil. Uh, so this is, this is uh, my effort to give an entertaining talk as well as an informative one. Um, We'll have to see how that goes. Um, so this is pretty much the same slides that I used at, at Daemon. So, so what's happening in traditional databases, and and and, and what's this? What's the situation that we're um, that we're facing? So this is a slide that I uh, unscrupulously borrowed the idea for from from Mike Stonebreaker, where where he showed that uh, the traditional database systems are being squeezed by the special uh, purpose uh, data stores. And, and so, uh, so this is the way the picture looks. You've got streaming on one corner, column store on the other, and, and main memory row stores at the top. And uh, the situ situation is, is uh, perceived to be getting even, even worse, and these, these separate areas are growing. And, and the comment that Stonebreaker made was, instead of, we ha instead of having a one-size-fits-all, we have a one-size-fits-none, where, where the traditional vendors are really being squeezed and their markets are being taken away. And, and so uh, this is a pretty, pretty challenging situation. And, you know, so the question is, are the, are the uh, traditional, yes? So the previous slide, are you just repeating what Stonebreaker stated, or are you repeating, are, are you stating it as a fact? That are, are, is it really the main memory systems and the streaming systems have really grown as big as to encroach? Yeah, a few slides. You'll have an answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so, yeah, main memory systems of the traditional vendors maybe maybe are, are dead. And what about Amazon Aurora? Uh, well, you know, uh, they may be next, right? Uh, uh, not. <laughs> this is not what's happening. Uh, uh, in fact, the elephants are continuing to dance. Uh, there's been no sign that that the uh, that the uh, uh, streaming folks or the column store folks or, or the main memory database folks are really taking significant market share from the traditional vendors. And so the question is why, right? And, and so uh, here's what's happening, right? You've got the traditional vendors. Um, with streaming, they've so, sort of formed a partnership where uh, streaming and, and, and the traditional database vendors live side by side, happily in peace, walking off into the sunset. Um, uh, the column store stuff has been pretty much absorbed into into the main traditional database engines, and the main memory row stores. Well, they're sort of a niche market, right? And and so so the question is, and what I'm going to focus mostly on is is the main memory row store part and the niche market part. And the question to be asked is why, why is that happening? Why why has why has that turned out to be the result? And so there's economic factors in play. Uh, uh, and uh, so um, we're working on cloud infrastructure. The cloud infrastructure has to be a uh, cheap commodity. Uh, the software infrastructure has to run on that effectively on that, on that uh, sort of uh, commodity hardware. Uh, this is a world where there's elastic provisioning. That is to say, you, when, when somebody doesn't use the resources, you want to free them up so that someone else can use them instead. Uh, you want basically the, the resources to go to the person who's got the most money and willing to pay for them, right? And so you want to give up uh, resources to higher valued uh, 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 applications. So the fact is that money talks. It doesn't matter whether it's what kind of money it is. Money talks. It matters, matters a lot. And so, and so uh, what we'll see is that money is talking very clearly, I think, in this case. And, and, uh, and so, uh, so let's proceed and see what, what happens. So, so what's the story with traditional uh, database systems? They're, they are what I call caching data stores. Uh, they're not main memory stores, they're caching data stores. Okay, so traditional database systems actually do offer good cost performance. Oh. Uh, the, the costs vary. So we need, to, we need to stop being fixated on, on solely on performance. We need to start thinking about cost as well as performance. Uh, uh, Traditional database systems have, have performance uh, that is lower than the main memory systems. That's sort of a, a fact of, of life. Uh, 
And yet they succeed in having better cost performance, which is sort of interesting. Why should that be? So what I'm going to do is suggest also at the end a change in, in the focus of our field to, not surprisingly, be more focused on cost performance than pure performance. So caching, what is a caching data store? Well, it uses a cache. Uh, duh. <laughs> of course it does, right? Uh, and and uh, what is a cache? Well, you move data from secondary storage to main memory uh, when the data needs to be operated on, and you move it back out of main memory when you're through using it or when it no longer makes any sense to keep it in cache because it's no longer hot. And, and uh, so, so it's this movement between main memory and secondary storage uh, which is the significant factor in why the traditional, traditional database systems are, in fact, still succeeding very well. Um, the fact is here, the data lives permanently on secondary storage, and it's only brought into the main memory uh, uh, as a caching proposition where, it's, where you act on it in main memory. Uh, and that's a very significant factor. So I'm going to talk about two forms of operation. This is a, a little bit... Um, uh, uh, of an abstract, of abstract way of thinking about it. But here's, here's what I'm going to look, look at. Uh, main memory operations, which are called MM, uh, they're the operations which find the data in main memory. And they're very fast. If you find the data in main memory, you just have an uh, 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 execution path through your, your access method or whatever and, and get to shovel the results back out to the users. Um, uh, the, se the, the se second set of operations is what I call secondary storage operations. Secondary storage operations are the ones where you find the data on secondary storage. You find it on, on, on usually that means flash nowadays. And, and uh, they're more expensive to execute by, a, by a, a not insignificant factor than the main memory operations are. And the reason why that is is because when you're dealing with data that's sitting, sitting currently on secondary storage, you have to bring it into memory, memory first. That's, that's an operation which, which, which costs uh, some, some amount of both dollars and time. And then you have to do the main memory operation after you bring, after you bring the operation into main memory. So, so that's going to be going to be more expensive, both in terms of uh, performance impact and in terms of dollars. So looking at it this way, uh, caching stores look like a bad idea. And here's a chart which shows why it's a bad idea. What it shows is that if you, as, as you mix secondary storage operations into the mix with, with, with main memory operations, guess what? The performance declines. The, the, what I've done here with these, these lines is simply show that, that this is a, a weighted average of the operations. And we did some experiments, actually. James did them, uh, which uh, produced the, the results in the, in the dots in between. And, I summarize the results as the, uh, the ratio between secondary storage operations and main memory operations is around 5.8. Uh, so, so that says that you know, if, you, if you have memory on secondary storage, you can expect that you, your performance will not be as good as it will be if the, memory, the, if the data is always in main memory. So this is, what is performance measured as? Is that throughput? Yeah, exactly. It's relative throughput. Yes, that's right. That's right. <coughs> okay. So this looks like it might be a performance disaster. Let's say each each <coughs> additional secondary stop, uh, secondary storage operation pushes the, the performance lower, and and it pushes it actually toward the, whatever the main mem whatever the secondary storage operations are. So so when you're when you're at the let me go back a minute when you're at at this end of the graph, you're getting main memory performance, at least for the caching system main memory. And at the far end, you're getting something close to uh, secondary storage operations. So the performance. secondary storage you're assuming is I'm solid assuming, state this. I'm assuming it's flash. flash. That's right. That's right. So, so why bother? Why bother with, with caching systems? Because costs matter. So, so now I want to take a look at, and this is sort of the harder to talk, let's look at cost performance, not just performance, but cost performance. There are two costs for operating on data. There are storage costs. Storage costs are paid all, all the time. Data has to sit someplace. Storage costs are most of the cost for cold data. So 
what is that? Why is that? Well, you're not operating on it, so there's no execution cost. Okay, so storage cost is a factor, whenever you have a big factor, whenever you have relatively cold data. The other cost is execution cost. This, this cost is paid when you're actually executing on the data. Uh, and it's most of the cost of, of hot data or when data becomes hot. So, so um, uh, uh, you know, if you're really banging on data very, very hard, uh, you're going to be paying the execution cost. And this is where the main memory systems have their advantage. But if you're, if you're, if you're uh, looking to um, service cold data as well, the cold data is going to be sitting on secondary storage if you have a caching system, whereas if you have a main memory system, it's going to be sitting in main memory. And main memory systems, as you'll see, uh, are more, more costly than secondary storage. So it's about relative costs here. So we have storage costs and we have execution costs. So if you look at um, this is the ratio, these are the ratios between, between main memory cost and flash storage. There aren't, there aren't any numbers here. There are, num there are numbers in my Damon paper, but there aren't any numbers here. There's just, just showing relative, relative costs. So main memory is approximately a factor of 10 more expensive than, than flash memory. On the other side, when you're talking about execution cost, these are, these are, these are numbers which are derived from, from the BW tree, uh, the main memory operation is, 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 is very low cost, and the, and the flash... Uh, Executing stuff from flash memory is re very costly. Uh, let me come over here and talk to you about this. So, so here's, after you bring stuff in from, from flash, you have to execute on it. So that's this cost here. This is the cost of the IO path. This is the cost of, 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 the, of, the, uh, of the processor executing the IO instruction going through, going through the IO stack. And this is the cost of buying uh, a, a, a secondary storage operation on flash. So, these operations on Flash, you have, to, you have to pay for them too. This is analogous to what Gray talked about when he talked about buying uh, disk operations uh, uh, in his five-minute rule paper. Yeah? So uh, in this cost analysis, are you considering also the data volume? Uh, like, for example, if you have five terabytes of data, right, an in-memory system, buying a five terabyte in-memory system is going to be inordinately more expensive than a hundred gigabyte in-memory system or gigabyte, right? Whereas you can easily have a five terabyte NVMe system, which is more or less commodity these, these days. So I think the price also probably starts increasing as soon if you want to go with larger data volumes. There's a, there's any number of ways of making this more complex. Okay. So this is this is not this is assuming just standard like maybe hundred gigabytes of that, that kind of. This is data sort, sort of uh, standard commodity okay. Uh, prices. Okay. Okay. So, so these are relative costs, um, and I'll have some uh, more things to say about it a bit later. And, and the reason why, so previously it used to cost you a lot to buy an IO access, but the current SSDs give you hundreds of thousands of IO IOPS, uh, and, and so the, the end result is that that drives down the cost of, 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 of buying IOPS substantially. So this is, this is the cost of buying one IO operation. Executing, yes. Yes. So, um, so on the left and right, the costs are in different units, isn't it? So on the left is kind of dollars. Yeah, yes, it's okay. yeah, yeah, that, that, <coughs> yeah, they're not, they're not the same units. That's right. They're, they're I'm not, these are just relative numbers, relative numbers here, relative numbers there. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm trying to say, like, on the left side, you're counting dollars, how many like money you're paying for a story. I'm counting, I'm counting dollars on the right as well. On the right. So yes, that's how, right. How do you count it? That well, way? by how much of the of the processor uh, uh, you you consume when it, doing your execution? Okay. Or how much of the SSD's uh, IOPS uh, uh, capability you're buying? Right. Okay. So it's costs on both sides. Okay. So we compute cost plotted against operations per second. So here I'm going to explain to you. I'm going to show you. This is the math. This is probably the only math I'm still capable of doing. But, but here's, here's the math involved. So the cost will turn out to be a linear function of the storage and execution costs. And here's what it looks like. So here's the, here's the, here's the, the linear function. So you have cost per second, which is what we're going to calculate, equals A, which is the cost for renting the storage for that, for that period of time, 
plus B, which is the cost per operation, times the number of operations you're executing. All right. So, so, um, so uh, what's going to happen is that what we're going to show is that, you know, this is a cost which you always pay, and this is a cost which you pay based on how many operations per second you're executing. Now, this, I hope, is, is, is clear because I'm going, to, I'm going to sort of depend upon this analysis uh, in, the, in the rest of the talk. So what is a storage, a storage cost? It's, it's, it's cost per byte times the size of the data. Right? And, and, um, and again, the, the interesting thing here is that DRAM costs 10 times the cost of the, of the flash. At, when you're executing no operations, storage cost is the entire cost of managing the data. Okay? And, and you'll see when I talk, when I show you the graph in the next slide, you'll see that that's the y intercept in the graph when over here, over on this end, when there's zero operations going on. The execution cost is whatever the cost per operation is. And that's what I showed you in the previous slide, that was the cost per operation, times the number of operations per second we're executing. So remember that now, what, and what I, <clears throat> the graph that I showed before, that the, the secondary storage operation is a factor of 12 or so more expensive than, than the main memory operation, because you have to, you have to buy the I.O. path, and you have to buy the IOPS uh, from, from, the, from the SSD. So, so this, this cost, if you go back here, this cost determines the slope of the line. So this is, again, a little linear equation, which, which uh, relates uh, the cost of the various pieces to the total cost that you face. And so here's, here's the graph. Uh, over on, on this side, where there's, there's zero operations, the cost is all the storage cost. And here you can see that the storage cost for, for main memory is a factor of 10 more than the uh, cost of the secondary storage operation. Uh, now, as you go to the to the to the right, uh, this goes up by a factor of twelve faster than this, this. This secondary storage operation goes up by a factor of twelve faster than the main memory operation does. Okay, so not surprisingly, at some point they meet, and that's what Ray's five-minute rule showed. Except that the computation suggests that it's now around one minute. Largely, again, because SSDs pr produce so many more IOPS. Right. The interesting thing about data caching systems is that they have the opportunity to choose the lower level, lower, lower cost operation. Now, nobody does this precisely, but the potential is there. We all sort of try to get good caching policies so that we approximate this curve where we're always using the lowest cost operation to manage our data. Bounded by the green line, though, can't you get the red line performance with caching? Um, if you have good locality, um, trying. So if you have, you know, if you have ex extremely high cache hit rate, then well, then then you're operating over here. Okay. This is the high ops per second area. This is the low ops per second area. By definition, you're having low low hit ratio over on this okay. side. Whereas you're having high hit ratio. It's per second, I guess. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Right. <clears throat> OK. So that's why that's the additional uh, degree of freedom that caching systems have versus, versus the other kinds of systems. So, so what about the other kinds of systems? And now I'm going to have, there's two comparisons I'm going to show you, talk about. And one is uh, main memory systems, OK? So, um, Main memory system, their performance is better than than uh, than uh, caching system, and, and indeed their their performance is better than the fully cached caching system. Uh, there's a lot of paths that they they don't have to execute. They can use specific and more tightly uh, bound to main memory. Uh, the assumption that all the memory all the all the data is in memory, so they they in fact have a, a better performance, uh, uh, and so. Here's the comparison. So Mastery has higher performance than the Deuteronomy's BW tree. It executes at around 2.6 or so factor faster than the BW tree does. 
it, it, t it turns out it takes, and this is sort of interesting, it takes in main memory now, it takes uh, around 2.3 times the amount of storage that the main, that the, the, that, uh, the BW tree takes. Okay, you say, well, one thing to remember, so I'll, I'll have qualifiers on this a little bit later. So, so what does that mean? So that means that you've got this, this cost graph. Here again, remember, this is the, our old uh, secondary storage operation with, the, with, the, with, the, with the, rising very sharply. This is the, 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 uh, the Deuteronomy uh, 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 curve, where, where the main memory curve, where, where it goes up slowly. And this is the, this is the, uh, the mass tree way up here. It's, notice its cost in terms of storage is approximately twice the cost of the, of the BW tree. And it goes up very, very slowly, right? And where it crosses is at around a hit ratio of once every three seconds for a 4K page. This, this ratio over here is about one, one, one minute when you, when you cross between the secondary storage operation and the Deuteronomy main memory operation. So your data has to be really hot in order, in order for you to profit from the higher performance of, main, of, of uh, mass tree, at least in terms of its cost implications. So Deuteronomy's cost performance is better all the way over to the three second point. And that's the region where, where, uh, where uh, the mass tree is better if you've got super hot data. But unlike the case where we're switching here between main memory operations and secondary storage operations, there's no switching between, between, between the BW tree and mass tree. You're sort of committed one way or the other. You, and, and so you have, to, you have to be prepared to, to choose which system you're going to use from the start. And so uh, I think I did a little cal calculation here. So if you're executing uh, uh, on a 40 gigabyte database, then you have to be executing at least 3 million operations per second before, before you're, uh, you're better off in terms of cost uh, by, using, by using the mastery. All right. So there's another aspect, and this is another system I wanted to compare with. Um, although this is much more hypothetical, we did no experiments on this. The Facebook, pro yeah. Sorry, can you go back to the sure. So how are you uh, talking about times here, like one minute and three seconds? What are what are those? Uh, what are those? Those are the those are the that's the interval interval sure. between operations. The 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 the, the, On the, 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 the head interval yeah, exactly. uh, uh, for for a piece of data, and and <coughs> it's it's. I'm, using a four four K page is only a matter of trying to trying to measure the, the, the general same what the temperature is of, of the data on a particular page. Uh, uh, again, with with the BW tree versus mass tree, you don't really have that choice, right? And the mass tree isn't paginated anyway. So so, but but this gives you an idea of what the relative temperatures are of these of these things. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So now, what about um, what about people who have enormous amounts of data, like Facebook? Okay, Facebook had a really uh, a bad problem because they wanted good performance uh, on cold data, and they were worried about costs. Uh, so they were in such a bad shape that they were actually. But this is this is a cider paper from a couple of years ago. I should have, should have probably included a reference to it, but. Um, the, the, they, were, they, were, uh, they were buying more processors, not because they needed more processors. They were buying more processors so that they could attach more SSDs right, uh, to accommodate the huge volume of data. And, and, uh, they needed processors or, or, or more PCI connections? Or what was the bottleneck? Was the CPU time? Or? No, it was just the connectivity to the, to, the, to the boxes. But I mean, like... It, 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 could it be solved by putting more cores in the CPU, or do you need to have like more motherboards with more PCI connections? You need to be able to attach more SSDs. Mm -hmm. I don't it's know what the answer is beyond that. Okay. No. I think there's in the commodity space. I think when you buy the boxes, you, you're limited to how many connections you can make to the SSDs. Okay. Right. So, so in that case, they would they would want like like really low power CPUs, but lots and lots of them. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. Yeah, that was the position they were in. Okay. Okay. So what was, their, what was their solution? Uh, well, they were using a data caching system, and what, to that they added uh, data compression as well. 
Okay, so so uh, they they needed low latency, uh, uh, so they used SSD storage, but and they scaled out the processes for 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 good performance, and then they used data compression to lower their storage costs. So what were they doing in this in in this in this model of performance that I've been showing you? Uh, Okay, so um, let me walk through this. This is our old uh, number on uh, secondary storage operations. Uh, this is the, the number for Deuteronomy's main, BW tree's main memory operations. This is where they meet way out there. And, and uh, uh, so, so what am I showing with this uh, purple line? This purple line is a secondary storage operation which features compressed data. So this is all hypothetical, right? I'm, I don't have access to the, the details of the Facebook members, but the, the intent was for me to show was that here, when you're using compressed data, the, 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 you, you start way down here because you're saving uh, storage costs, right? Because you've just squeezed your, your storage costs way down because you're using only some fraction of the storage that you were using, using before. Let's say it's one third. So, so, so this is going to be one third the storage cost of the uncompressed data sitting on secondary storage. And so you're, you're saving on storage costs here. Remember, this is where the data is not being used at all, okay? But now when you, when you start using the data, and you bring and you start accessing it. You bring it into memory. Now you have to now you have to start paying the cost of not only the I/O path and the IOPS. You have to sit, you have to pay the cost of the CPU compressing and decompressing the data as well. Can you compress the memory? Well, yes, you could. Sure. sure. Would that would that be in the middle triangle then? Or, or? Well, if you compressed. On main memory using this curve, that, what that would do would be to to lower the cost here and raise the slope. Okay, so when you compress, you lower the, you lower the storage cost but increase the slope because you're paying an execution cost. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so memory uh, for the main memory systems, you mean all the data have to be in main memory? Right? Yes. So that's there are right. some techniques. Even I think even Microsoft have this uh, Siberia technique from Hecate, right? Yes. You can support. Uh, code data on secondary storage for an uh, in-memory optimized database, but you don't measure the cost for that kind of technique. Either. So, so um, to a first approximation, nobody uses oh. the systems that way. Oh, uh, <laughs> I know. I so C Siberia was 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 a research project. Uh -huh. It's not part of Microsoft's product. Right. Um, what they've done, you know, this is a complex space, and I've obviously simplified it. But, but what they've done is they've 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 embedded Hecaton code into the larger SQL Server. So if you have Hecaton tables, you can execute Hecaton code on it. Right. But the data has to be in main memory. Right. If you have tables which are resident on secondary storage, then you have to use the traditional sort of classic SQL Server engine on that. And you can do joins across them, but you, you're committed to, to one or the other depending upon how you define your tables. Sure. So, but, but I don't know of anybody who actually uses, uh, Stoneberg had a paper on anti-caching also. These, all these, all these, all these, all these uh, efforts, starting with main memory uh, uh, database technology, uh, aren't really designed to have most of the data sitting on secondary storage. And so, and so um, those papers are all written in the following style. If the, mem if the data is too big to fit in main memory, we'll let some of it drift off to secondary storage. But that's not what I'm saying here. What I'm saying here is you want to push main memory, I want to put, push data out of main memory when it's not cost effective to leave it there. And that could happen long before you run out of main memory because you're going to free up main memory for something somebody who has a higher use for it. Okay. Is, is the, um, I have a question about well, the Facebook example. So it, it's the fact that you said most of the data is cold. Is that a function of the volume of the data or of just how actually it's used? Because I mean, it, it's something like LinkedIn. Is LinkedIn mostly stored on secondary storage? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they're all. St yeah, there's too much data to store it in main memory. Uh, Facebook, even Mohan can't keep. Uh, Facebook data hot, right? You know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I thought, I thought, I thought, um, I thought LinkedIn was, was, was hash tables. They have hash tables against, the hash tables are on secondary storage, or the, the log is? I don't know. 
I mean, I, I don't know the I don't know the details of how the, how how Facebook works. Well, right, because there's two two <clears throat> interesting things about Facebook. One is that when you put something on there, you never delete it, so it gets very old and very cold. And second, everything you put on there is like three to three hundred megabytes in size, right? Everything put on Facebook is quite large. But so, I wonder which one was. So they've got a, they've either way they've got to push it out of main memory. They they only want to use main memory when they need when they need it to to actually execute on the data. This is a paper that describes their secondary storage architecture for yeah. cold data. Yeah. Okay. I, I yeah. Well, well, the data is really I cold. Exactly where it appeared. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They made it for Facebook. And it's cold. for Facebook. For Facebook. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think they I think they, they use our table meeting. Hmm? I think they use an archival meeting. Yeah, they are, yeah. yeah they, so when the data is really cost cold, very cost conscious on the yeah, cold yeah, data. Yeah, yeah. So so uh, Mohan's data will never be on archival media, but it will not be kept in, in storage in main memory. Mohan might be posing more of the streaming volume. Because I think you, <laughs> 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 upload the images, it still gets cold, right? So it's just more images, more cold data. Okay. Well, we'll have also stream well, the stuff. I don't want to let this go on too long. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit unfair, but it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
do an update by posting a delta update to our mapping table in memory. So, so a blind writes don't require a, 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 an access to get the data to put, put the stuff in the right place. Another, another thing here is, what do I want to talk about here? Oh, log structuring. So, so and this is true, again, in a, in a way with both RocksDB and with our stuff, which is, which is uh, you take the pressure off the right side of it at any rate by, by only supporting large writes. And so you have a, a small number of very large writes that you do. That's the characteristic of what log structuring does. You have these long, enormous buffers and you, and you write them out and instead of having to write out every single page individually, where you have to execute the I.O. Uh, 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 code path in, in, in the processor, and you don't have to buy an extra IOP on the, on the, uh, on the uh, uh, SSD, that reduces your costs and improves your performance as well if on the right path. The third thing is having, uh, having a record cache. So all these numbers that I've shown you are mostly show, show flag you on what, what, what the relative costs are or what the relative access rates are for using a 4K page. But the smaller the, the memory unit that you're log, looking at, the longer you can afford to keep that unit in main memory. So if you have a record cache, and you can be more selective as well. So if you have a record cache, you can keep that record in main memory longer than you can a paginated store which contains a lot of extra data. So that's another thing. And frankly, both RocksDB and us, we do the Deuteronomy stuff, do that in a certain different ways, but we, we both do it, right? And, and we do it in, in, by keeping our Delta updates around, and we also do it by having a, a record cache at our transactional component as well. So, so um, uh, having having records as opposed to as opposed to pages helps. We also have pages, so we have a page cache as well as does RocksDB. But but uh, the fact that you have a record cache means that you can keep the keep the, the, the data around longer in main memory and, and get a better performance out of it as well. You can reduce data movement cost between secondary storage and main memory, and and a bunch of ways to do that. One way is to make the I/O path shorter by using um, uh, user level I/O that, that cuts out the operating system, puts you in charge of the cache of the of the scheduling. If you buy one of the newer SSDs, which support a larger number of IOPS, then that'll drive the cost down for the IOPS as well. Or you can do what we're trying to do this summer, uh, which is to uh, change. What the SSD does, that's they change what the SSD controller does, so that the um, so that the interface that you when you pass stuff back and forth between the interface, uh, you'll lower the cost. And I'm not going to talk about that in detail because because Ivan is going to talk about that next week. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, it involves getting uh, in, in my world down and dirty with the SSD, and and th thankfully. Uh, Yvonne has a, a little bit more experience with that dirty part of the system than I do, so we count on him for doing the right stuff. And then you, finally, you can reduce the cost of secondary storage. Now, I've talked about compressing, compressing data. That's obviously one way to do it. That raises your operation cost, but it certainly reduces your storage cost. And here's a, a sort of a gratuitous comment, which is that I don't think that NVRAM is going to carry the day because, because it's a cost. They, they don't tell you what the cost is, but that's a sure sign that it costs more than they'd like you to know. Um, uh, and so it's a factor of three or so, I'm guessing, more expensive than flash memory. And, and so used as a, an SSD technology, it doesn't look so attractive to me. Um, you can also say, well, what about, what about reducing secondary storage costs by using disks? And you can do that too. And you can use you can tape as well, right? So if you've got cold enough data, if you've got cold enough data, and you don't have stringent access times requirements to get to it, then that's what you should be doing, right? Uh, because because when the when the access rate is low enough, the overwhelming part of the cost that you're facing is the storage cost, which can be enormous. So you want to drive that storage cost down, uh, appropriate with the level of heat that you find in your data, right? 
So that's how you make a good cost performance. So a couple of caveats. Our numbers are approximate, right? Uh, so all, all, all of this, and I'll show you how they are approximate. So performance is based on a set of point experiments executed on our machines using mostly our Deuteronomy system. So, so, so um, you know, uh, you generalize it at, at some risk, but, you know, um, I think they tell a story that's interesting. Um, the costs are taken from the web. I scoured the web looking for costs. They vary a lot, even in one instant of time, and they're changing over time, right? So, so it's, not a, it's, not a, uh, uh, it's not something which is etched in stone here, like, like that. Uh, don't, the, <laughs> your, your next comment on, on the Amazon gravestone, you know, it's, it's not etched in stone. Uh, but I think that the general thrust of the results gives you a, a good way of thinking about how to design your system, and why data caching systems are, in fact, a, a very good idea. So, so that's one caveat. Second caveat is best cost performance is not the only thing that you need to worry about. Okay, uh, and maybe it's not even the the prime. It may not even be the primary thing that you worry about. So certainly, it's always ca case that low cost is a plus. But what you want to maximize is not is not the minimizing cost. You want to maximize value, which is the difference between what you earn from processing the data and what it costs you, right? And so if you're one of these applications uh, which has really high value for, that needs and uh, tremendous needs for low latency, maybe you don't want to use a data caching system. Maybe that's the niche where the main memory stuff makes sense, right? Uh, uh, because, you know, they've got very high costs, but, you know, if the value is enormous and, and if the value sort of comes from your being just a little bit faster than the other guy, uh, then, then you, you may be willing to spend a whole lot more money and not worry so much about the lowest cost. And, and uh, so, uh, yeah, so stock, so many stock trading things are, are of that flavor. But there's not a whole lot. I mean, I think the vast majority of, of the applications are more concerned with, with, uh, with you know, so, some sort of thing which is suitable for uh, an interactive system of some sort. Uh, now, you know, there's an enormous spectrum. I'm not, not trying to say that there's anything in between, because there is. And you have to decide which, 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 which place your system fits in that. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, m trying to minimize your, your cost, maximize your cost performance is a goal that most people, and certainly the, 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 the traditional systems, should be aiming at as a, way, as a way to keep the majority of their customers happy. All right. So recap. So, and this, this is the, the critical thing. I just want to remind you, there's two costs. Storage cost and execution cost. And you, you always pay the storage cost, even if nothing's happening on your data, right? And so that's a really significant aspect of that. And, and so if nothing's happening on your data, you want to work as hard as you can to reduce the storage costs. So when data is cold, storage cost is most of the cost. When data is hot, then you say, say well, okay, execution cost really starts to matter here. But, but uh, most data... Most of the time is cold. And they win by moving data between the low cost medium, which, uh, which doesn't have as much performance, but has a higher cost of operation. They move it from there to the high cost medium, main memory, which is higher cost on a, on a, on a sort of a time basis for the storage, but it has a lower execution cost. And, and you switch between the two uh, based on what you approximate to be the crossover point. And so the moral is this, we should be focusing on data caching systems and their improvements. Is Amazon Aurora a data caching system? Yes. Okay. So this, uh, I, I can't leave you without getting in a, a plug from our advertisers. This, this talk is brought to you by the BW tree in production. It's in SQL Server. Uh, it's the main, only the main memory part. It's an Azure Document DB. It's the one that makes it possible for, for, for it's now called Cosmos DB. Uh, it makes it possible for them to offer uh, immediate indexing of documents which are just loaded. Uh, and this is a real problem because in, 
what happens when a document comes in, it has index terms from all over the key space. And if you try to update the whole key space immediately, um, uh, you end up touching all the data and having to bring it all in. And this is an example where the blind writes and being able to execute code which does blind writes which don't require putting this stuff all the way home in, in, the, in the original uh, uh, secondary storage location uh, matters a lot. And then uh, Bing Object Store is another, another place where we're used. And there are some references. And uh, so thank you for your time. And the top reference is the, the Daemon stuff. It's actually, I found out something interesting when I submitted my paper to Daemon. Um, I, I think this is ACM, maybe it's ACM general policy, but they offer you the option of, of uh, uh, retaining copyright uh, to your article and just giving them use, uh, a certain kind of fair use. Um, and what, they, what you lose on that is they won't defend your uh, copyright uh, uh, like they would if you would turn the copyright over to them. But it seems to, in my test, my brief test of it, uh, it seems to permit you to go to the ACM's website and, and download the document without, without having to cross their paywall. So, so uh, that, that I thought was sort of interesting. Now, maybe they only offer it on workshops and, and not, in, not in their conferences. But, but at any rate, uh, I, I chose to make it more widely available, so you can freely download it from from, from this. Yeah. <clears throat> what about hard drives? Hard disk drives. Where does that where does that fit in on the cost? There's a lot that's been done on producing low cost hard drive systems with the expectation that they're going to be used for very cold data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just another layer in the hierarchy. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, so, so I, I think that that's, that's exactly the right way to look at it. And, and uh, you know, uh, I think this is true of Socrates, that a lot of the data, <clears throat> a lot of the data is, is, uh, is on, on hard disk. And, but when they're actively uh, uh, running with data, they actually store a lot of it on SSDs. Uh, so, so they, they stage it, and, and I think that uh, multi-level hierarchies are an interesting way. I mean, it's, it's a more complicated system, right? Every time you introduce an extra layer in the system, the system becomes that much more complicated. But there's money at stake. So, so, uh, so going back, for instance, to uh, uh, NVRAM technology, uh, I'm not a big... Uh, uh, I don't think that NVRAM is going to play a big role in the SSD market. But I haven't ruled out the fact that it might play an interesting role as simply a memory extension, where it's actually cheaper than main memory, uh, than DRAM. And, and of course, it has the durability property. Uh, but it's slower as well. So it too has, I can imagine you coming up with a, with a, uh, a, uh, um, you know, a similar kind of curves to what I've shown here, which talk about when you should migrate data between, <coughs> between, between your your cold main memory store and your hot main memory store. And I think the same sort of reasoning applies to that case, except that the, the cost of moving the data between the two is a lot lower. So, so I think that makes a perhaps a reasonably attractive package uh, to go for. But in terms of an SSD replacement, I don't think that, I mean, Intel's trying to sell it for that, but I don't think well, so. Your numbers, you know, you're only showing less than a 6x difference between SSD and DRAM, and you're trying to put something in between. You don't have a lot. Of, you don't have a lot of um, flexibility there to deal with. I mean, you've got. No, to, there's a 10 There has to be data that has the right, the, the right access rate in and and size in order to benefit from yes. having something so let me, in let me, that. Let me go back. In that narrow slot, right? I don't think it's as narrow as you think. Yeah, so um, let me get the pure one. Uh, so uh, what the lower cost would be, uh, I think that the, the cost difference between, between DRAM and main memory and between, between well, it would be, be halfway in between. It would be about halfway in between. It's about a factor of three, I think, in each direction. Okay. okay. So, so, so what you're seeing is a, is a curve which starts here, right? which starts substantially below this, right? And it has a curve on what its cost 
increases are, and its cost increases in terms of in terms of execution. It's rather slow, because uh, uh, rather low slope because the, the the cost of executing that doesn't include an I/O path, doesn't include buying uh, an I/O op, and so it sort of increases more gradually. So it, I think I think that you might see that this goes out over to here someplace, right? In terms of in terms of the times at which it's a lower cost operation. Now, all this is hypothetical because nobody's built a system quite like that yet. But, but I think that's an interesting, interesting thing to pursue. Where simply pursuing it in terms of replacing, it, replacing flash storage with it, all you do is add a factor of three or so to the, to, the, to the memory cost, and you don't change this line at all because you still have the I.O. access time and blah, blah, blah. So, so, so you've, got to, you've got to think about it in terms of, in terms of, of, of uh, how, how the entry comes in in terms of what both its storage costs are and its execution costs. Yeah. So, so you're basically saying for that that the green line will be shallower. For yes, that's right. Yes, yes, yes. If, if you use it as a main memory extension. Okay. okay. Yeah. With, with these coprocessors like GPUs or FPGAs, it seems like the cost per operation, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that cost might be affected. And I'm wondering which way does that go? Like is, Maybe they make this shallower. I have no idea. Like uh, that might be the workflow too, right? <laughs> if you say like data warehousing workflows, I think I think so. So, so I don't quite know how to model that, but, but I think the important thing with those sort of things is how much prep time you need versus how much gain you get, right? And and if if you can if you can reduce the prep time, the same way if you can reduce the if you can reduce the amount of code you have to execute to do an I/O operation. That means you can afford more I/O operations. If you can reduce the amount of prep time that you need, the amount of computation you need for prepping uh, those those devices, uh, uh, then you can use them more frequently. So, so, uh, but uh, but I don't have any great insights. Into that. Right. If you could do decompression on the um, FPGA, right? Yeah, compression is the obvious place where right. it might matter. Mm -hmm. Else. What about power cost? Have you done? Have you looked at that at all to know? I mean, people talk so much about the importance of, of power efficiency in the data center. Is that a factor here? Do you think? Or, you no. Know? I mean, with so, hard drives, so, it was more obvious because you're spinning this physical uh, thing. Yeah. This is well, all semiconductor. Yeah. So, so um, even even with hard drives, uh, once you got the thing spinning. Uh, it was the movement of the arm, which was most of the most of the power cost. With with SSDs, the power the power is, is only the, based on the access rates. It's really I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a stable medium. It doesn't. Mean. So, but I don't know. It's a, it's a small matter. It's a lot of cost. What about what about the cost of building the facility? What about the cost of you know the get, getting the customers to to use it? Blah blah blah. You know, there's a lot of cost. I think the, the interesting thing here, though, is you, you've got something which has a, sort of a component which has a multiplicity of uses, and, and, and its cost, if you can isolate its costs, uh, uh, you can, in fact, compare costs between one thing and the other. You know, if the application has this enormous path through it before you get to the data caching store of one form or another, if it has this long path, uh, then most of the cost is going to be consumed in the application, and so maybe the maybe the data management costs don't matter all that much anyway. But but I don't think you can think that. I don't. I think that's a. You, if you go down that path too far, we end up saying cost doesn't matter any place, and, and and so and so you need to t start taking costs seriously everywhere, right? And and one of the things the Hackathon people found was you know they did this they did this. Storage engine, which was enormously faster than anything that they had before, and then they found, well, you know, yeah, but the performance impact on, of that on on the whole database engine is, you know, fifteen percent, right, or twenty percent, right? You need to be able to attack the entire uh, path in order to be able to have a, a significant impact on on overall performance, and that's true of cost as well. So. But but I don't do the rest of the stack, so I can only talk about data management. <laughs> so thank you all for listening. Thanks.